Hello, it's Scott Manley with episode 63 of Interstellar Quest and Durdos Kerman is descending towards the surface of Gilly in a quest for science. You look down to the surface, it's so close. Of course, you don't want to end up lithobraking on those hills by accident. But at this speed, would it really be that bad? And you can log some gravity data. The gravity is ridiculous. Playing curveball in Gilly might end up putting the ball into orbit. The temperature, what does the temperature say? It doesn't say if it's in Celsius or Fahrenheit or Kelvin or anything else for that matter. Anyway, yeah, um, Durdos is heading towards the surface. This whole thing, if you remember, is propelled with monopropellant because we only need, you know, less than 100 uh, meters per second delta V to perform a complete landing here. In fact, I pretty much had to put this at high speed because... Getting down to the surface is a very, very long and tedious process. In fact, this is a lot faster than it would have otherwise been because the thing I'm landing on is about four kilometers above uh, what corresponds to sea level here or average sea level. I mean, regardless, it uh, takes us or it saves us a bunch of time doing that. The only thing uh, to be concerned about here, I guess, is that the solar panel is on one side and I have to keep it angled towards the sun. I meant to put that on with symmetry, but I clearly completely forgot because I'm stupid. Uh, so yeah, we are going to end up on a hillside as well. Thankfully, the reaction wheels on this thing will be able to keep it from rolling down the hill. I just roll sideways, kill lateral velocity, and let gravity slowly pull me towards the surface. At a whole 1.1 meter per second, 1.3, 1. 1.5, kill the velocity, and touch, touch, touchdown! No, not, t no, maybe? Okay, yeah, this is the thing when you land on Gilly, you kind of have to turn off your uh, ASAS, otherwise the vehicle will not sit flat on the surface. The force of gravity can easily be counteracted by the reaction wheels. Of course, those reaction wheels in Kerbal Space Program are ridiculously strong compared to reality, but it's just one of the concessions to realism that the game makes in terms of making it playable for most people. As it happens, I have been dissecting such uh, choices as I uh, write a presentation which is to be shown to you know, a bunch of uh, science types. You know, Can Kerbal Space Program teach you to be a rocket scientist? Anyway, Durdos Kerman, let's go off the ladder and tries to touch a passing peak. KSC tells you to go back in your capsule and raise your damn periaps. Well, uh, too late for that, but uh, his it, the good news is that his feet were able to s absorb the shock of litho-breaking against the vicious gravitational regime that is Gilly. Getting around on Gilly absolutely requires the use of the EVA pack. If you try to walk in where you, you will end up jumping and you don't have much control while you're jumping. I, I, I'm just wondering, could you actually... Um, could you actually fly using the MMU that they tested on the space shuttle? I think the acceleration of gravity here is about half a centimeter per second per second. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether the 25 feet per second fuel of that thing would actually work. Anyway, there, look, there he is. He took a step on the surface. World's longest step. Actually, no, let's, uh, let's try and take another, another step. A little more bold this time. Whee! Okay, I can't hold, I can't make that noise for this long. Yeah! yeah! Wow, it's so high! Yeah, this is not really becoming of a Kerbal, is it? Durdos Kerman, just watching the surface inch towards him. And touchdown once more. Well, uh, practically that was a separate suborbital flight. Wait, there's a planet below me? Does it even have gravity? We shall keep that data for later. You have a hard time picking up some dust samples as it flies out of your scoop and into the sky. Indeed, it will probably fly up into the sky and trigger a Kessler syndrome here if it wasn't for the fact that uh, the satellites aren't moving particularly fast either. Well, flag time. This is an important body in the pantheon of uh, Kerbal Conquered Bodies. It, uh, it is the original asteroid. It's the first asteroid, really, oh, except for the magic boulder. Look, this is the asteroid that most people know, right? So, yeah, 
the original asteroid. You know, not like those young upstart asteroids. This one can't be pushed around. Not like those newcomers to the scene. Oh, no. Those newcomers are... Um, yeah, those are wimps. Those are lightweights compared to Gilly. The, unlike those new ones, Gilly won't get pushed around. Yes. Anyway, it's back to the capsule. We go for more science and investigation and stuff. We have a bunch of instruments to check. We have, uh, obviously, the materials bay and the, um, the goo experiment. Let's see what they have to say about things, as I've just transmitted all my spare science already. <laughs> That's I cut out all the transmission of the old science. You don't need to know about that. When disturbed, the objects take a long time to return to the floor in a new and interesting pattern. You wonder if you could sell the materials lab as a piece of modern art. I wonder indeed. We'd have to get it home first, which is a long way away. And the mystery goo experiment. The goo is acting like it's about to go home. I'm not sure how it's going to go home. It's certainly not going to go home with the help of gravity. Uh, we have gravity data here, which will tell us that the needle in the gravity sensor seems to have moved about half a millimeter. Uh, so one wonders. That means then the the display must be about 10 centimeters, right? To have half a millimeter, assuming it's a linear scale. The thermometer says you were expecting Gilly to be a hot potato. You note your disappointment with the moon's cold surface. I'm thinking they're thinking uh, hot potato because they want a snack, but uh, once again they will be in for a disappointment because uh, they can't really eat gilly. And besides, I think uh, Minmus is more their style, being that it is made of, of something that resembles pudding. So the double C seismometer, well, it says that gilly seems to be seismically as dead as a doorknob. At least for a little while. Anyway, yeah, I go and spend some time flying around the surface of Gilly. In fact, I could probably go anywhere in Gilly and come back with ease. The only limitation really is that we have 12 hours of air supply and food supply in this spacesuit. That kind of limits where you can really go. We kind of flew up to the top. And uh, then we decided to take a... We planted a flag you can see there. I can see. And then... Took another little flight back home towards the towards the station and Okay, gotta slow down, slow down, and okay, we are not gonna I think I'm gonna overshoot. Oh, a little too aggressive, slow down. Oh no, pull up, 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 oh, ow, ow, that's gonna hurt. That's gonna hurt. And I hope that doesn't make him seasick or motion sick because he is really a long way from a bucket right now. The only bucket is his helmet and nobody wants that. It is actually a legitimate problem of, you know, astronauts being sick inside of helmets. Uh, it it has happened, I believe, and uh, they like to make sure that people spend a lot of time uh, on sp on the inside before they let them uh, out in a space. They let them acclimatize, so to speak. Anyway, I was saying that uh, the planet or the moon of Gilly is somewhat seismically uh, inactive. Well, originally, I thought I would have some gear in these things, but foolishly, they were completely empty. I Apparently, at some point, after filling them up, I must have saved it differently or lost whatever was inside it. So these are just dead weight, which means now they are part of the seismic sample experiment. And Sonzon Kerman here is going to do uh, use his EVA pack to put this on a high-velocity collision course with Gilly. And by high-velocity, I mean about 30 meters per second. There's only so much Delta V you can actually get from this, considering, like, considering that I flew for a second and I'm literally flying outside the sphere of influence. Bit of work slows it down onto the, uh, the most eccentric orbit that I can. I can leave this behind, and in that time I was accelerating, I moved a whole 1.3 kilometers away from the EVE Explorer. So it'll be a quick flight back to make sure that the to make sure that he gets back safely before we uh, sit back and watch the fireworks, the epic fireworks that this toolbox will bring as it returns to the surface of Gilly at almost hyperbolic speeds, almost being about 30 meters per second. But look, it will provide us science if we do things correctly. And in we go. 
So back to the surface, we set up our very important scientific experiment to collect the impact data, or record the impact data. The surface will be monitored. And now we have to monitor this and watch it as it arcs high above the moon of Gilly, which is sitting there serenely, not realizing what is about to hit it in but a few hours. After I go back to the asteroid diverter and change its course, because uh, we have to do some work there. Yeah, the asteroid diverter, of course, is continuing to uh, put itself into orbit. It is on a highly eccentric orbit. We're aiming for a roughly a 200 by a 200 kilometer orbit. And that means a lot of very slow acceleration, which I pretty much can cut out. This is one of the reasons these, mo these videos take a long time to create, because I do a lot of these things when you don't see them. Anyway, this is now falling back towards the surface. Gilly does not know what's about to hit it. It is unaware of the damage which will occur. And, I, and believe it or not, the Kerbals are unaware also. They are actually interested. That's why they have deployed their scientific instruments to observe the cataclysm that is about to occur. Just any minute now. 32 meters per second and... and it did actually explode. Good news. Okay, because if it had bounced, then I would have been all out of ideas. Well, let's see what this thing has done. Okay, we have... Oh, look, the sun is about to set here. Um, collect impact data. Sons and Kerman debris impacted into Gilly, producing seismic activity. From this data information, the structure of Gilly's crust can be determined. You know what? I don't think it has a crust. I think it has a regolith. Um, crust would tend to imply a liquid interior, if you ask me. But perhaps I'm wrong because, you know, planet I'm not a planetologist. I'm just guessing. So, yeah, we have a whole lot of... Uh, a whole lot more maneuvering to do, of course, with the asteroid diverter. I decide that I want to adjust its orbit into a something which is more or less a flat, low inclination orbit, which means a lot of, you know, firing the engine perpendicular to the orbit, bringing it down. Um, so you see, we've already brought our apoaps down to 3,704. We still have a long way to go. But you know what? We have plenty of Delta V. This engine is ridiculously efficient. Somebody said, how do you have so much fuel after diverting the thing? The reason I have so much fuel is because this engine is so darn efficient because it is using super high temperature plasma that is fed by, uh, you know, beamed power. It's putting a gigawatt of power into this plasma, heating it to... You know, really, really hot temperatures, containing those inside a magnetic field and letting them shoot out the back, and pushing the spacecraft forward as a result. And so, yeah, there is a lot of maneuvering for me to do. Um, yeah, and the other thing is that every now and then you would end up in a regime where you're only getting a few hundred megawatts, if that. The sun is what the kind of minimum baseline. You'll get a hundred megawatts or so when pointed at the sun now because I have the two solar satellites there. Unfortunately, due to a glitch, I'm not going to show you the other solar satellites getting put into orbit because the changes to joint rigidity basically induce oscillations in my solar satellite, and I don't know how to fix that anymore, so I'm just going to fake them into orbit. <gasps> anyway, it's time for Durdos Kerman. Having spent uh, 15 hours on the surface of this uh, little planetoid, he is about to head back. We're harnessing the amazing power of the, these reaction control engines. He is able to dis ascend into the skies like a rocket. A whole, well, I'm only getting velocity relative to the target, but he's probably moving at a whole 10 meters per second now. So yeah, he needs to get up and rendezvous here. And you see me kind of tweaking around with my orbit here, trying to figure out the best way to go. Um, of course, this is a 3D problem, so I kind of start out like that. Look around. Come on. Come on. I need to uh, get that as close as possible. That looks pretty close. That's probably a good place to start here. And once we get up there, we'll have to have a madcap dash to catch up with it. Oh, no. That's moving it further apart. Um, this doesn't seem... Okay, I guess I'm going to accelerate forwards in the orbit to more or less make this thing go the right way. And we're going to be 4.5 kilometers away. That's not particularly close, is it? But there we are, heading upwards. 
Can you see me from here? I probably can actually. If uh, I should, I should have probably used the distant object thing to uh, see this thing from this uh, grand distance of twelve kilometers. But I completely forgot. Oh yeah, are obviously at the wrong orbit there. So we bring things down, make a lot of adjusting. This is all, of course, four times normal speed because you really don't want to see me doing this. Uh, and seeing all these adjustments in real time because it is rather long and tedious. So start to get closer and closer and closer and and 1.2, 1 1.0, 0 0.9, 0 0.1. That's going to be good enough for me. So a little fly up to meet the Eve Explorer, which has most definitely not exploded despite the way I pronounce it sounding like exploder to a number of people. Like, can't you tell the difference between exploder and explorer? I think I know what it is because I kind of roll the R's in there. Yes, people like the rolling of the R's. Anyway, anyway, time to do some docking here. Clampatron docking port is hot. We're ready to mate with this thing in low gilly orbit. Dardos is moving his butt into position. This is kind of like a diving bell if you look at it. At least this design has the docking ports looking in a somewhat sane position. As in, you should be able to walk through these things to the capsule in question. And docked! Yay! So that is us returned to this. Now, I guess I do have a couple of other crewmen. They might want to pay a visit. We do have a lot of RCS fuel, but that'll be later. Anyway, the asteroid diverter continues its epic Sisyphean task to slow this rock down. It's actually the opposite of Sisyphean. It's trying to slow a rock and put it into orbit rather than raise it out of orbit or something, isn't it? Um, but it does take several orbits for this thing to bring the object down into an orbit which will ultimately be acceptable. We're going to store it there so that we can then... Um, send some spacecraft up to study it. Not that there's really any more science to be gained from it, but I think it would be cool if we built like a little base, a little, you know, asteroid observation environment around it. Who knows? Anyway, because of our launch schedule, the next vehicle which is ready is the unnamed descendant of Zardoz, which we will call Tundoz from now on. We've got Dancy, Lars, and Jebediah Kerman. And uh, we have a payload which apparently is quite heavy because this thing did not want to nose up. You can just about see it nosing up at the last minute. And then I became terribly worried that I was going to tear my spacecraft apart. But ultimately, you don't need to see the whole flight into space. So I'm just going to skip forward to the rendezvous with the asteroid and the asteroid diverter. B612 for the win. This will become, I guess, base B612 or B612. We are going to perform final, final deceleration and orbit synchronization using... Uh, RCS. We're out of liquid fuel now, and or we're out of liquid fuel and oxidizer, so the only thing we can really use is beamed power, and I'm not going to use that because that is a slow, lower thrust than the RCS a lot of the time. Anyway, we put the spacecraft into position underneath it ever so carefully. This is on the dark side of the asteroid. Now, uh, this is the this is the new part of the base here. It has RCS on board because we need to make sure that it rendezvous with the target or docks with the target. It clasps onto the target with its claw. So a little bit of RCS to move the spacecraft away from the payload. And it's time for one of the crew to actually fly through underneath this thing and get in. Uh, due to an error in the packing, we managed to put both the doors on the underside. So we have to eject it from the bay and then send a bold crewman over to actually get inside the thing. This is the first time I've actually used the Coppola module, incidentally. The, the one which lets you see in all directions. I think that's a good one to have. Um, it's a good one to have things on that are attaching to the asteroids, to have the claws on. Because it has all this extra visibility. But... Uh, it is a very, very heavy pod, and it doesn't actually... It only has room for one uh, pilot. So yeah, he's going to get on board, and it's going to turn this whole thing around and start it pointing at the target. One of the things I became aware of, incidentally, is if you have a target that is already docked, and you say target the center of mass, 
then it will target the center of mass between that and the other ship as well because it'll include the mass of the linked ships so initially i point at that and then i think wait a second i'm pointing you know at the joint there i don't want to grab onto it so in the end i had to kind of manually guess where the center of the asteroid is and make adjustments that are appropriate so anyway uh we'll continue this in episode 64 until then i'm scott manley fly safe